the text. Uh, our sermon this evening consists of Job chapter 1, uh, the last three verses of the chapter, 20, 21, and 22, which I'll now reread. After all those servants came to Job and tell, told him that his, all his possessions were gone, all his children were dead, and we read, Then Job arose, and rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Beloved, the first chapter of Job records for us how Job awoke one morning being the richest man in the East and perhaps even the richest man in the entire world at that time and by sundown he was reduced to poverty. We read in this chapter that in the morning he had 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses, and in the evening he had none. We read that in the morning he had 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels. By the evening they were all killed or stolen. In the morning he had seven sons and three daughters, and in the evening he was childless. And in the morning, he had many servants, but in the evening, he only had four servants left. And those four servants brought him uh, tidings which he did not want to hear. Put yourself in Job's shoes for just a moment. How do you think you would have responded if this kind of news came to you, what if a flood or a fire or uh, a great wind came and blew down your house and destroyed all your possessions so that when you would come home from church to evening, there would be nothing but a heap of rubble? And what if through some destructive force all your children were taken away from you so that you were left childless and what if in this great state of poverty that you would be in that your spouse your husband or wife would look at you and say you have nothing left to live for curse god and die that's what Job's wife says to him in the following chapter. And so put yourself in Job's shoes. How would you respond? Well, this chapter, Job chapter 1, and the following chapter, speak to us of Job's immediate response to this very heavy trial that God placed upon him. And notice in the first place that Job, how he responded. He responded with grief. Because in verse 20 we read, Then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head. And these actions were uh, a visible expression of his grief. He was a grieving man. And that tells us that it's not wrong for the child of God to grieve when we encounter difficult situations in this life, when things are so grievous in this life and we are brought down very low, it's all right for us to grieve. It's all right for us to shed tears of sorrow. It's not the case that we simply have to stoically go about this life thinking that, well, that's the way it is and that there's nothing I can do about it. But there is a time to weep. There is a time for sorrow. 
And we read here that Job grieved. And so may we. We may weep in our sorrow, but we may not charge God foolishly. So that in the first place, Job, he, he responded with grief. In the second place, we notice how Job responded. He responded by worshiping God. That's verse 22, that uh, having rent his mantle, having shaved his head, he fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And these terms refer to his posture uh, and to his attitude in worship. Uh, we don't do that uh, when we worship God here in church. We don't fall down on the ground and worship Him. But that doesn't mean that if we are brought very low, I think one of the very first responses we would be would be to fall down to the ground in, uh, in an attitude and a posture that we have no power, we have no control, we are simply subservient to the will of God. And so such is the posture of a humble man who knows that he is helpless and that he depends upon God alone. But then in the third place, Job's response is this, that he made a remarkable confession. In verse 21, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, what beautiful words to confess in the midst of great sorrow and great tribulation. And by these words, Job indicates that he is bearing his suffering patiently, that he is submitting himself to the will of God. And especially from this confession of Job, we too must take a lesson. And so let us examine this confession of Job and let's make it ours when God sends afflictions in our lives as well. And so we look at the last three verses of the first chapter of Job under this theme, our response to great afflictions. Notice in the first place, confessing God's sovereignty. That's what Job did. Secondly, confessing God's love. And finally, Blessing God's name. Now the central part of Job's confession is this, what he says, Jehovah gave and Jehovah hath taken away. Uh, and so right here, right away, we recognize that Job confesses that what has befallen him was the work of God the Lord. And so Job is confessing that God is a sovereign God even in the things that God sends to all his children. Now, to this startling and really somewhat shocking confession of Job, perhaps we might be inclined and take Job aside and say, no, Job, you are wrong. This was not so much the work of God, but this was the work of Satan. And indeed, we do read of Satan's hand in all of this, uh, in all of Job's affliction. That's what we read of earlier in the chapter in verse 6, that one day the sons of God came to present themselves before God, and that has reference to the angels of God who surround his throne and do his bidding. They appeared before God, but with these good angels we read that Satan also appeared in heaven. And God noticed Satan and addressed him. And God knows Satan. God knows that it is the, uh, the work of the devil and his purpose to thwart God's cause and in God's purpose in time and in history. And so God asked Satan in verse 8, 
Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in all the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and eschewth evil? And it was as though God were asking Satan, if you really think that you can destroy my kingdom in this world, have you considered my servant Job? For he is a faithful citizen in my kingdom. And in response, Satan acknowledged his inability to cause Job to become unfaithful. Satan recognized he doesn't have the power to do that. And Satan argues here that it was because God gave Job great riches, so many animals, so many possessions, and, 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 and all his children, that it was, as it were, a hedge around Job, so that nothing could get into Job. And so uh, Satan said to God, but if you take away everything that Job has, everything that you've given him, then your servant Job, curse you to your face. And so what Satan is doing here is, is this. He is questioning the motive of Job's love and obedience. It's the mind of Satan that the only reason that Job is worshiping you, God, is because you give him so many things. But if you take him away, it's going to become obvious. Job will curse you to your face. And so God understood this as a challenge. If Job served God, not in the power of a regenerated child of God, but simply because God gave him all these possessions and all these riches, if that was the reason that Job served God, then it would be clear that Job was never a citizen of God's kingdom. And so God will demonstrate to Satan that Satan's argument is wrong and God permits Satan to take all those possessions away. And so from a certain point of view, yes, it is the case that Satan's hand is involved here and that Job's trial was the work of Satan. Uh, it was Satan's idea that Job be afflicted it was also Satan's work because Satan was given the power to accomplish it, although subject to the power and to the will of God. But anyways, we might say to Job, Job, you are wrong. You are wrong to say that Jehovah hath given and that Jehovah hath taken away. And we might even be inclined to say in our own lives that the trials that come upon us aren't really set from God, but that they're the work of Satan and him alone. But if that were our attitude, we would be wrong. Because Job is right. God hath given and God hath taken away. Job here in the text confesses Jeho Job confesses God to be the ultimate cause of what has happened to him. Such terrible things that we can hardly imagine it. But Job said, this is the work of God. God, God gave and God hath taken away. Now, Job doesn't need to know all the hows and all the whys concerning why God sends affliction to his people. Job doesn't have to know that Satan appeared before God and that God and Satan had this discourse. Job doesn't need to know any of that. All Job simply needs to know and what he does confess, what he does believe, is that God is a sovereign God who performs all that he has determined to do. That God is sovereign 
which Job, Job understood that. God's sovereignty refers to his authority in the first place. God has all authority. He may do as he please, pleases. Man may not question the sovereignty of God. We, we are simply the works of his hands. We are the vessels. He is the potter. We know from Romans chapter 9 that may the, the vessel say anything to the potter? Why did you make me this way? Why did you make me another way? Why did you make that vessel that way? The, pot, the, the, the vessels do not have that authority. They may not question the potter because the potter is sovereign. And here too, God is sovereign. He has all authority and he has all power as well. And so, Job confesses that when he says, Jehovah hath given and Jehovah hath taken away. Now, perhaps the first part of Job's confession is very easy for us to understand. When Job says, the Lord gave. Well, sometimes we ignore that fact. Sometimes we think that the things that we have, we have because we have worked so hard and because I have labored so industriously. But we know that God is the one who gives unto us everything. He gives unto us our clothing. He gives unto us our homes all our physical possessions, all our talents, all our abilities, they are all given to us by our sovereign God. Now, that's easy to confess. Uh, many nominal evangelical Christians will, will, will agree with us. Well, of course that's the case. God is sovereign. He does do all those things. And that comes very naturally and easy to us that the Lord gives. But... The text also teaches that what is true of God giving is also true of God taking away from us. Jehovah hath given, Jehovah hath taken away. God gives to his people according to his will and according to his good pleasure. And it's also the sovereign prerogative of God to take things away at times and to leave us with not as many possessions, not as many loved ones, not as many talents and abilities, perhaps even as we grow older. But he does this in his love for us. And so the word of God to us in the Bible is this. Do not ever say that Jehovah gives, but that the devil takes away. Jehovah wanted me to keep all my possessions. Jehovah wanted me to keep all my loved ones or whatever, or what have you. But the devil who is stronger came and took them all away and wrecked them out of my hands. Do not ever say that, but rather confess the sovereign power of God. He alone is God. Let's not question God foolishly. When all these difficulties came upon Job, Job did not say, now God, why did you do this? What was your conversation that you had with Satan? Why did you give him permission to do all this to me? Job simply said, I submit myself to you, God gave me all these things and you've taken them away. Blessed be the name of God. But why does God take? It's easy for us to understand what, how God gives and why God gives. But why does God take? And why does he take sometimes what is so precious to us? And the answer is that God takes even in his love. Job recognizes that. Job confesses God's love. 
And we see here in the text that Job trusted God's faithful love. He knew that even those afflictions that God sent upon him were sent in Jehovah's faithful love toward him. Now, Satan tried in all these afflictions to make Job think that God really hated him. Uh, notice in the first place that while the camels and the oxen and the asses were stolen, the sheep were destroyed in a different way. The sheep were destroyed by, we read, of the fire of God coming down out of heaven and consuming them. Now these sheep were animals which Job would uh, primarily have used for his burnt offerings and for all of his sacrifices. And these animals God destroyed by an act of judgment. Whenever we read a fire in Scripture, and whenever we see it in its destructive nature, that's a picture of the wrath of God and the judgment of God. Think back to the time of Abraham and Lot, and think to what God did to those wicked, wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He rained fire and brimstone as judgment for all those, all their sins, and He destroyed that city and then, too, at the end of the world, God will judge this world with fire. But now, Satan wants Job to ask, Why has God judged me by burning all my sheep? Is not God pleased with my sacrifices? And in the second place, we see here that all Job's children are killed. Satan had a purpose in this as well because Job knew that God was a covenant God. Job loved his children. He prayed for them. He sacrificed for them. He knew that his godliness would be the godliness of his children, but he did have his doubts at times and he sacrificed for his children. But he knew God's covenant faithfulness and now Job might have thought at this point when all his children are taken away, God has no covenant with me. He just destroyed all my children. God must despise me. And in the third place, Satan used Job's sacrifices for his children against him. We're told earlier in the chapter that Job's sons and his daughters, they, they made a habit of feasting and drinking wine in their elder brother's house. And uh, Job is a godly father, and he's very concerned about the spiritual welfare of his children. And that's why we read that he sacrificed for, for them continually and that the Bible says, or Job says, it may be that my sons have sinned. And when he sacrificed for his sons and for his daughters, it was a picture of the favor of God and a picture that all their sins were washed away in the blood of the Lamb to come. And after Job sacrificed, you can imagine his happiness and his joy and his delight. He, he was refreshed. He had just partaken of the means of grace. And after all these sacrifices were over, he left the altar with a renewed sense of God's love and of God's favor for him and for his children. But now Satan with permission by God, sent that strong wind, and it blew down the four corners of that house in which all Job's children were, and killed them all. And, and by this, Satan wanted Job to conclude, all my sacrifices that I did for my children, they're useless. They didn't serve one purpose. God was never pleased with my sacrifices. 
God was never pleased with anything that I did for my children and that my children were never the recipients of his favor. It, it would be as if you or I were sitting under the preaching of the gospel and we had just heard the, the most encouraging sermon a sermon that we could almost memorize because it was so memorable and our hearts raced during the entire sermon because we heard of God's love for us in Jesus Christ and it would be as if after hearing such a good sermon and being filled spiritually that we would go home to find that some great calamity had befallen us with Satan wanting us to ask, what's the use of it all? I was just so encouraged in church by, by the sermon I, I heard, and, and now this, the, my, my house is gone, my children are gone, all my possessions are gone. And Satan would want us to conclude that God hates us, and that's the seed that he tried to plant in Job's mind as well. And so in similar ways, Satan directs our attention to the calamities God sends in our life and tries to make us think that God really isn't pleased with us and that God really doesn't find any delight in us and he, that he doesn't give us grace when we lose at work, when we lose our finances, when things become very tight, and when family and friends forsake us because we love the truth of the gospel, because we are sitting here this evening, and we find that from an earthly point of view, things, things just aren't going my way. I, I'm not as happy as what I, I would like to be. I'm not as popular uh, or as I would like to be. And in all these difficult, understandably of course, difficult situations of life, the devil would have us conclude, God doesn't love me. He's not prospering my life. He's not giving me what I think I deserve. And so God must not have any favor for me at all. Well, what did Job do? Did Job utterly despair? Did Job conclude, well, God must not love me at all? That's not what Job did. But Job clung to the faithful love of God. Notice in the text that Job does not use the, the, the normal, the ordinary word God, but the name Jehovah. When he says the Lord gave, the Lord taketh away, you notice that, that as you probably all well know, that word Lord in capital letters here in the Old Testament literally means Jehovah. And that name Jehovah refers to God as the unchanging, faithful, covenant God. It was as if Job is saying, well, it's not as if, he was saying this, the faithful God of the covenant, the God who does not change at all in his love for me, that God gave, and he is the same one who took uh, from me. And this faithfulness of Jehovah to his covenant is always rooted in his love. His faithfulness to his covenant is, is grounded in his love for us in Jesus Christ. And so we conclude that to some degree, Job understood this faithful love of Jehovah. Job according to the measure of his understanding, well, he did not conclude, all of this that fell upon me, well, it came because of the Chaldeans. It came because of the Sabaeans, or any of those other 
groups of people who stole all his possessions away. No, but Job understood that this came from Jehovah, the God who loved him. And so, uh, in this respect, we notice that the work of God in sending affliction and the work of Satan uh, in working in affliction, the work of God and the work of Satan are greatly contrasted. Because from a certain point of view, a child of God, you or me, we could fall into a very difficult temptation, well, a trial. And from an outward point of view, that circumstance can be used as a trial and a temptation. With regard to the devil's point of view, he will use that difficult situation as a temptation to get us to stumble and to fall into sin. But God uses that exact same situation as a trial to purify us, to refine us, and to cause us to grow in our love for Him. And so, such is Job's perspective as well. Uh, the, there isn't even a hint here in the text that Job considered the possibility that God might now hate him and that all the goodness that God had shown to him in the past was really only a pretended love, and that God never really did love him. Job doesn't even think that, and there's not a hint of that in the text. Uh, in fact, if Job did think that God hated him, then Job would have charged God foolishly. But Job did not charge God foolishly. But in saying, Jehovah hath given, Jehovah hath taken away. Job meant to say, God has done this in his love, and I will submit to the will of God. And so such must be our confession in all the trials of our life as well. You know, the prosperity gospel in this world teaches that God will bless you, but the way in which God blesses you is giving you more and more things. And the more things God gives you, the more He blesses you. Well, what about Job? Right here, in this situation, we know that later in Job's life that, that, Job blessed, that God blessed Job. But right now, would we say because God took everything away from Job that God has disfavor for Job? That God is holding something against Job because God has taken everything away from him? The prosperity gospel is not consistent and this example of Job uh, is an answer to that false gospel, that health and wealth gospel. But we know that uh, it must be our confession in, in our lives that it doesn't matter how many possessions we have. What matters is that we confess that God is good, that God is faithful, that God does not change in His purpose, and that God, if God loves me, he will continue to love me. And there, there may be times that God chastises us and that He rebukes us and that His hand is heavy upon us. But it's always for our welfare. It's always for our good. And, and, and even when we look back upon our own lives, we see God's hand leading us and guiding us. Part of the faithfulness of God right now is that we are sitting here this evening hearing the preaching of the gospel. That's God's faithfulness. Now when we look back in our lives and we see how God was faithful, would, are, are we, do we have any doubt in our mind that as we go forward in life that God will continue to be faithful to us? He will. He will continue to love us because He is Jehovah, the unchanging faithful God of the covenant. And whether he gives unto us many possessions, 
whether he gives unto us little possessions, really, whether he gives unto us many children or no children at all, really, is besides the point, because this we know, God loves me, and he is faithful, and he is unchanging, and I know that he will go with me in the future. We know that it's the case that he also sends grievous afflictions. We know that he corrects. We know that he chastises. We know that he refines. We know that he purifies. That's called the work of sanctification. Growing more and more holy in our lives. Sometimes it hurts when he refines us by fire. But we know it's for our benefit and we know it's done out of his love for us. And so, do you believe and confess this faithful love of Jehovah God? I already said that earlier in the sermon, but I ask the question again. If you were to go home tonight and everything that you have amassed in your entire life is gone, Everything, so that the only thing that you have would be the clothes on your back. Would you still confess God's sovereign love? In faith, we do believe and we do confess the sovereign love of Jehovah for us because we know that God is a wise God. Now the wisdom of God, which we may not question, the wisdom of God comes out in this text as well. Uh, God's wisdom is His ability to direct all things in this world to their stated end. And God did, does that very precisely according to His good pleasure. But God determines and He directs all things so that they work together for the one goal that He has determined, the glory of His name, and for the glory of the name of His Son, Jesus Christ. And in two ways, the text indicates that Job believed in Jehovah as a wise God. Notice in the first place we read, In all this Job sinned not, nor charge God foolishly. Literally, uh, we read here, Job did not charge God with folly. Job did not say, God, you are a fool. He did not attribute folly to God. And so inasmuch as Job did not attribute folly to God, we may rightfully conclude that Job attributed to God all the wisdom in the world. Job knew God was not a God of folly because God is a God of ultimate and supreme wisdom. But in the second place, Job believed in the wise God when we read, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Now, uh, of course, Job knows that he's not going to enter back into his mother's womb, but he means that he will go back to the dust of the ground. And here, uh, even Job understood the Old Testament, well, at least the Old Testament that we have, and Job had in mind the words God spoke to Adam, dust thou art, dust to dust thou shalt return. And when Job says, naked have I entered into this world and naked shall I return thither, uh, Job is expressing that he was really unworthy to have any of those possessions that God gave him in the first place. Because Job confesses, I came into this world naked. I didn't have anything. Nothing at all, completely naked. And he also confesses, naked shall I return thither. Uh, I 
and, and he recognizes that all those things that God did give unto him really weren't his own and that he was unworthy of all those things. But by these words as well, Job also confessed God's wisdom as a preparation for the day of his death. Uh, when he says, naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. Job knows that he is going to return to the dust of the ground, and Job viewed the taking away of all of his things as preparation for that day when he shall enter the dust of the ground again in physical death. And so the question is for us, do we confess Jehovah's wisdom in our afflictions? How quickly we are prone to charge God with folly because in our lives we make our own plans and we have our own ideas of how we would like our lives to be to, to, to run. That we want so many possessions, we want to live in such and such a place, and we want such and such a standard of living, and lo and behold, things don't happen the way that we want them to happen. And as a matter of fact, things happen the exact opposite the way that we had planned. And, and our inclination is to get mad and to get angry and to get frustrated and to say, God, why are you doing this to me? This isn't the way that I want things to be. Don't you want me to be happy? Don't you know that the way that you can give me happiness is by giving me what I want? And our inclination is to, to, to shake our fist at God and to say, give me what I want when I want it, and then I will confess that thou art a sovereign God. But we know that in all our afflictions, we mustn't despair, we mustn't charge God with folly, we know that He's sovereign, we love His sovereignty, we don't want it any other way. Would you imagine if we were in control? And if we could determine what would happen in our lives, uh, we, we would make a complete mess of our lives. We would give ourselves so many things that our minds and our hearts would be set upon the things of this earth where moth and rust do corrupt. But God is wise. God is sovereign. And in all our afflictions, we follow the godly example of Job when here in the text, he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. God, Job desired that God's name be blessed. And so again, after all these things happened to Job, Job didn't yell, he didn't scream, he didn't throw a temper tantrum, he didn't shake his fist at God, but, but he grieved. He fell down and he worshiped God and he says humbly and soberly, blessed be the name of the Lord. Beloved, let, let every man, woman, and child here, who, when we experience affliction, perhaps not even that, that could compare to the affliction that Job experienced. Let us, when we experience affliction, we may grieve, we may sorrow, but let us worship. And let us always say this as well, Blessed be the name of the Lord. When similar calamities fall upon you, do not blame God, do not charge God with folly, say, blessed be the name of God. And when others come and comfort you, perhaps unbelievers, and they try to turn your mind away from God, and they try to accuse you of sin, 
and they and that you have done something wrong and that's why God has his hand is heavy upon you even in those situations simply ascribe God all the glory and say I will not ascribe I will not question God's motives I will not question his ways I will submit myself I will grieve and I will bless the name of the Lord and in desiring that Jehovah's name be blessed, Job demonstrated the preserving grace of God that God gives to all his people. Now we see here that God is faithful. That that's the name that's used, Jehovah. He is faithful to his people. Uh, and here God is faithful to Job. If there was one person in the world who had every right to, well, from an earthly point of view, of course, who had every right to shake his fist at God and to curse God and to abandon everything that he had grown up to believe, it would be this man, Job. Everything gone in one day. And what explains that? What explains this response of Job? Don't think that he was such a godly man. He was a godly man. But it wasn't in his own power that he made this confession. He never could. It's impossible by nature for you and me to do this. It's only because of the faithfulness of God. God's grace is so strong that in this day of trial and affliction, our faith does not falter, but that we, he holds us in the hollow of his hand. We can't see his hand upholding us all the time, but he's there, and his hand is embracing us. And, and when we don't think, when we're being squeezed and pressed in this life, well, sometimes that's the hand of God squeezing and pressing us closer in his love and in his grace, but it's the grace of God that preserved Job here. That's a powerful grace. It's a grace that is efficacious. It's a grace that accomplishes its purpose and God is a faithful preserving God and so here too in all of this we see comfort for us in all God's trials have you ever thought about how you would react if something like this would happen to you everything would be taken away from you no more possessions no more children, no more family, uh, and, and everything looks at, as if you will never have anything more in this life. Know that God is faithful. Know that God will preserve you. And even in the midst of those afflictions, confess His love. Confess His sovereignty. Confess his wisdom bless his name and even though it might be the case that God will give back to you many things it will be the case that God will bless you not necessarily with physical things but he will bless you with his grace he will uphold you with his hand and in the final analysis isn't that what we want we really don't want things in this life. We really don't need to amass so many things and to think that that's the way that God blesses me. The way that God blesses now is by His grace and by causing us to grow in the knowledge of His Son and of the great salvation that He has given unto us in Jesus Christ. And so may it be for us too in the times of trial well, sometimes we are inclined to charge God with folly and to question His ways for us. But then even in those times, we know that God's love is strong and powerful and that God will turn us and that He will give us grace and preserve us. And know this too, that in all these things, God will prevail. 
in the war between God and Satan, God will have the victory. He has. When we look to the cross of Jesus Christ, where Christ has spoiled principalities and powers, and we know that our salvation is secure, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God which He has for us in Jesus Christ. And when we know this love of God for us in Christ, and when we pray for grace to glorify God in all our afflictions, then God too will give us grace so that we will say right along with Job, Blessed be the name of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love thee. We love thy son, Jesus Christ. We pray that thou wilt keep us from despair when thy hand is heavy upon us in this life, when we experience great trials and afflictions. Because all of us, in a certain degree, will and do, and we are experiencing affliction. We pray, Father, uphold us cause that even these afflictions work for our benefit and that we grow in our love for thee knowing that thou art strong thou art powerful and that thou doest all things for the good of thy glory and for the good of thy church as well we rest in thy goodness and we love thy faithfulness to us forgive all our sins Bless us as we go about our duties once again in the week before us. May we be shining lights here in Limerick of the power of thy grace which works in us. That we may show unto others that thou hast called us out of the darkness of this world into the marvelous light of the kingdom of thy dear Son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.